welcome to another update episode, if you like, of the podcast where I catch up with some of my previous guests. Today, I'm talking to Topi Yokaranta, very good friend from Retig Group. When we last spoke, he was the head of Group Treasury back in April 2019. Now, he's the CFO. This is one of our update episodes where we talk to some of our treasurers, in this case, three years later, and we talk to Topi about how Treasury prepared him in the positive and some of the negative ways for being a CFO. What it did, you know, it's a springboard episode, springboard into CFO ship. Enjoy today's episode. This week, delighted by joined by a good old friend of mine, Toppy Jokaranta, from where well, he's currently the head of Group Treasury at Rettig, as we. Uh, he showed my enunciation of uh, my Finnish. He's actually finished by background. And Rettig is a Finnish family-owned investment group with approximately, well, Euro, 1 billion of turnover and a variety of different investments. But, you know, we'll come on to that a bit later. Topi can explain that. You studied and then did national service and things. And talk us through then and how you came to London, Treasury and everything else. So give us a, give us a kickoff from there. What happens obviously here in Finland is national service is compulsory. Roughly you do a year crawling in the forest. And then after that, most of people continue their studies. After that, studied in Amsterdam, BBA degree there, then moved to London. And that's really where the whole uh, treasury career started. No way. And then, and you say you moved to London and you thought, oh, London wasn't too nice. Uh, let's, let's go to Bracknell or talk you through. Cause you actually started at Kula Packard and before the show, we were saying that We've previously interviewed Connor Ma, who used to be at HP, and obviously there's a few other guys that have sort of gone HP and some of the similar places yourself. But how did that role come about and how did you hear about Treasury? As part of the studies, we had to work somewhere abroad. And I happened to do my work training as part of the studies at Juliet Packard. Through that, I ended up just contacting the same organization and it, that they have this European Treasury Center uh, in the UK. And then I just got lucky. I managed to uh, get my first uh, treasury job there. It was cash management. It's really just learning the very basics. But it was great because, you know, there were many other fairly junior people there and also then some seniors to guide you through. For example, Corner was there at the same time. And so that was the, the first cut really to treasury systems and money market and a little bit of foreign exchange and all these things kind of started flooding in. And that was how I ended up there through um, university, really. And was Treasury an accidental choice? Or had you heard about it before? Or did you think, oh, that's an area I want to be in? Because obviously that was, that was quite a while ago. So it was still not in its infancy. It had been around for a while. But, you know, we said a lot of people get into Treasury by accident a lot of the time. Yes, I think it was half accident. I'm, I right. majored in corporate finance. So I wanted to do something to do with finance. And I very nearly stayed in Amsterdam. I, I wanted to and something to do with, you know, perhaps the stock market, perhaps derivatives. And uh, there, there was a possibility to stay there and, and uh, start learning and, and work with options. But then I thought, you know, perhaps um, I would prefer to work for a real company. So I ended up actually then um, in treasury. So half accident, but then that turned out to be a very good accident. And I really haven't looked back since. And then you joined Ray Christopher Regis. So talk, talk us through some of the moves then that happened. That was a fairly busy time. We built some uh, cash forecasting systems there. It was expanding very, very fast. They just gone public. This was before Regis. I joined. Just explain. Regis. This is, yeah, this is Regis. Correct. Yeah, CS Regis PLC, and 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 so it was really just learning to be a public company and and really building various pieces of the treasury, expanding very fast. Some people could say even too fast. And then um, obviously that was also at the time when. Um, when the 9-11 attacks happened and that uh, Regis had a big flagship office in, in New York. So that was a very strange time that then caused uh, real issues for the company. And that was a fairly short stint that I did there, but I learned a lot because, you know, really it was myself and Ray. And, uh, and then uh, millions of things happening. And so that was interesting to say the least, but I learned a lot. And that was probably the first time when I sort of also understood that, you know, things might also go wrong. Things are not just sunshine and rosy all the way through. And as a charity junior guy, I had to deal with, you know, issues with the banks and some pretty heavy discussions. 
during that year, especially the sort of latter part of it, I think it was a good experience in all the, you know, all the horrible um, things that happened around it. But um, I did learn a lot. Mm. And so I, I don't think I'll ever forget that. And then you moved on and you sort of, by that stage, so you've been sort of treasury manager stroke analyst, but then you were, you know, you, you joined Diageo, you know, talk us through the moves and the progression there. Diageo was then a role when, um, when I then wanted to get some more exposure to front office foreign exchange. And really that's where I learned my foreign exchange first time. It was a pretty big treasury, also a pretty sophisticated treasury. And I suppose that was a very different view in that, you know, we were at the head office doing big numbers, huge numbers of deals. Also, that was the intensity of foreign exchange dealing platforms. So, you know, things started to get more digital and less phones and more tapping on your computer. And so that was, that was the first piece there. And I said, you know, I was a big, big treasury. So you could see a lot of things going on, not just foreign exchange, but, you know, capital market stuff, a very large accounting part that was happening there and, um, you know, in the same office. So again, that was a very different treasury, but again, a great ground to learn because you had a lot of people and you had a lot of also senior experienced people to guide you through. What was Jajir like? You say he was sort of developing there. You know, what, you know, what transformation did you see? Because you did quite a lot of project stuff and, you know, a lot of progression for yourself. I enjoyed it. First of all, you know, it was great. It was a great company to work for. And so um, I think it had to, a lot to do with systems, treasury systems, dealing platforms and all of these things. And that had a particular flavor to it. And so I did, I suppose, you know, the first time again there, I had to be part of these teams, you know, that implemented these, you know, various systems. We also had a lot of fairly sophisticated analysis there. We, I remember we had a couple of PhD students there all the time running some pretty amazing models. And, and so it was a very different approach to financial risk and, and, and risk analysis and risk management. And I suppose that's really, you know, working at the front office and then um, a little bit of capital markets there as well, bond issues and, and these kind of things begins to give you a more rounded view of what are the different parts in a large treasury. It was pretty high pace as well. It was, things happened fast, a lot of things, big numbers. And so um, I, I guess, you know, it was part of the journey where you learn and um, that there is a lot more that revolves around treasury, not just, you know, you and your desk and, and the immediate things you see, how things link together. And yeah. I suppose. And then you made the move, you've done three years at Diageo and it was time for the next career move. Is that the right way to describe it? Cadbury was looking to beef up their treasury. They also had a new treasurer and, um, and they wanted to largely overhaul their financial risk management processes in treasury again to do with the treasury systems. And so, um, that was an opportunity, which was a little bit too good to decline. Mm -hmm. So talk us through your role there, because you had good progression over, what, the next five years sort of thing with, with Cabaret. And obviously it was changing a lot before it eventually got pulled out by Kraft Foods and things. But talk us through when you, what was it like when you walked in the door? The first impression was that it was a little bit stuck in its old ways. And the need was there to, to overhaul a lot of the processes. And that's really, you know, that sort of set the pace for the next year and a half or two new systems, new risk management policies, or, and, you know, rebuilding the team and enjoyed a lot. There was a lot happening, a lot of M&A pieces as well. Some bits sold, mainly the drinks business, and then um, other bits fought. And again, getting a different view where you kind of have to dismantle old processes and, you know, rebuild them again. And, and that I enjoyed a lot. I also then moved to Singapore for a couple of years to really look after their Asia Pacific area and it was a regional set up. So, you know, I suppose the head office was obviously in London, but the regions were not necessarily that close to the head office. And so, um, one of the reasons why I moved to Singapore then was to kind of, you know, pull some of the cash management things together, risk management, hedging processes, and, um, if not establish those, there was a guy there before me who moved to Japan. And so the old opening was there. So I kind of just continued what this, what, what this particular person had started setting up 
And it was really just getting the visibility from the region to, to head office. But it was risk management. It was repatriation, taking, you know, participating into these kind of projects. It did, it did involve quite a lot of traveling just to make sure that, you know, you understand what was happening in, in all those countries. Yeah. Good fun, but that was a lot of traveling because really it was anything from Japan to China, India, and then all the way to Australia and New Zealand. So that was a, that was quite an area. We spoke to Chris Emsley from General Mills, and he's you know down in actually Singapore. He's the Asian Pacific Treasurer there, and he, he again talked through the sort of journey that they've been through and establishing new things. I think what was it? You know, you say you took over from someone, you came in. You walked into this sort of Singapore office, but it sounds like you, they, they were doing stuff their own way. Or how did you land there as this European guy that's just sort of, you know, with, and then work with the guys? Or what was your ethos around? How did you make it work? The regional office was set up some years ago before that, um, but it was mainly really set up by guys from Australia because Australia was the biggest manufacturing base for the drinks and the confectionery at the time. What really was needed is just going through all the countries, just understanding what's happening in there and how to build up a process, almost like a, a consultant approach to understand what's going on, what needs revision, and then implementing the revisions. Of course, you know, then just reporting back to the head office involved a lot of setting up a risk management reporting and other things which could flow back and forth um, between London and the, and the region there. But you have to mix the culture into it. Obviously, when you go to the region and they focus a lot more on the operations, they're not really too necessarily too fussed about what's going on at the head office. It's too far away. Uh, for a company of that size, it definitely is too far away. And and so my role was really just to make sure that the, the treasury set up there developed and is much more under control when it comes to cash risk forecasting and also various things that, you know, had to happen. There was a lot happening in India, uh, not the easiest country with all sorts of regulations. There was a lot happening in Australia, selling one of the drinks businesses, repatriate, big, big repatriation project, which we pushed through. And so it's interesting to see the regional setup because, you know, it, it gives you an eye, it sort of reminds you that that's where the money is made. And they're much more concerned about selling stuff, the operations, the manufacturing, everything else, instead of the, the typical thing that happened at the head office. And so that gave me the perspective that, you know, you really got to have to listen to the guys on the ground before you start dropping decisions on them. Yeah. I mean, and they brought mix the, 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 Exactly. And then you mix yeah. the cultural thing to that. One thing is, you know, perhaps having a clear idea in your head what to do, but when it comes to implementing something in Japan, in Thailand, or in Australia, you have to do it in a very different way uh, mm -hmm. in, in all these countries. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was an absolute stunning trip for, for a couple of years, even though it was pretty busy. Lots of time on the plane. Yes. And then, then you decided you have enough time on the plane. It's time to come back to and work back in the UK. Or what, what prompted that? Really was just a sick moment, you know, it, it was kind of agreed that it's about two years and that that's really what it was. Went back to the head office and, and really we continued setting up the regional treasury at the same time when I was in the Asia Pacific, uh, same thing was happening in, in, in America's region, same thing was happening in the EMEA. And so we had the two other regional treasurers who worked, you know, and, and did exactly the same sort of thing in all the regions. And of course, by the time I was back, it was much more much more in control and so we could focus a, a little bit more on you know maybe leading it heavier from the um maybe that's not the right word but you know having a better control from the head office and then focusing on other things you could layer on like cash pooling and other things which you could then develop it was just a natural step to come back and of course by the time i came back this takeover talk started with craft first it was friendly talk and then it turned hostile very quickly and we know how it turned out and it was a bit of a shock to all of us how it really turned out. And so before I left the craft treasury, if I remember right, was in Switzerland. And, um, and then, of course, they wanted to consolidate a lot of the functional um, treasury work. I decided that that wasn't for me anymore. That was the kind of natural time to then perhaps look for something else. We also came back. We came back from Singapore, just made it back before, the, before our second kit was born. 
maybe that was another sort of natural point to kind of think, well, okay, perhaps we'll, uh, we'll do something else. Yeah. So you completed your experience there of confectionery, consumer goods and everything else, and then made another consumer move to retail. So to Tesco, talk us through that. And then, so you did Tesco and then you decided to head back to Finland and stuff, but talk, talk us through those couple of moves. Yes, Tesco was a little bit like Cadbury. It was a story where a lot more visibility was needed. Instead of having regions, they had very, very large businesses in Eastern Europe and in Asia. Also, um, some in the US wasn't that big, but anyway, you know, the visibility in those businesses wasn't necessarily where it could have been. Yet some of the core processes with Tesco Bank and, and the whole cash management and all that stuff was actually um, very good. And so, again, it was more of a story of, you know, trying to pull together and understand what's going on in the businesses. And of course, it did involve, well, not really that much hedging, but, you know, a lot to do with funding and, and forecasting and pulling that in together such that you could have visibility and lead it a little bit more efficiently from, uh, from the head office. And you were international treasurer there, so you were obviously dealing globally, or what were the regions that you focused on? All the regions, really. We had Eastern Europe and, of course, UK. That was big. Asia was big. South Korea, Thailand. Mm -hmm. And so we had a team member in Thailand. We had somebody in Hong Kong. Tesco was an interesting in the sense that it, they also had a very large property business. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to build these shopping malls. And what you would have in the UK is the shops. But in China, it was shopping malls. Mm -hmm. It was a massive property business, which was booming. And that required quite a bit of quite a bit of attention because the numbers were big and it was mushrooming. So that was part, Eastern Europe was much more established, but regulations in various countries make it a bit difficult if you compare Hungary to UK or Poland to UK, then you kind of really have to understand what's going on in the ground. The businesses yeah. were really big, so you had to really have a pretty grasp of what's going on there. So that was again a sort of a I wouldn't call it a project, but it was similar kind of tasks to understand what's going on there and pull it together for the head office to manage better. And then you decided to head back to Finland. What happened? Well, family happened really. By this time, two small kids, uh, my wife had graduated. Uh, she, she went back to uni when we were in London and really she wanted to really think about moving back. Working in London would have required a much bigger house, all pairs and all sorts of other things. And so um, at the end of the day, I think it was a mutual decision to then perhaps come back here. Mm. Also other family reasons, our parents obviously are not getting any younger. It was one of those decisions to come back. And then of course, us both being Finns, it was easy in the sense that, you know, it's, it's a bit of a reverse culture of shock, having been abroad quite a long time, but turned out well. What happened next was really just a, a long two-year project for an American company. Tell us about Carestream. Carestream was a medical business of Kodak. It was basically emerged from the troubled photos and, and cameras business. Um, but this was top-notch imaging business, which is to do with the x-rays or x-ray technology and various imaging technology. And again, a very different business in the sense they were present in a huge amount of countries around the world, a pretty large business as well, about 2 billion uh, turnover. But it was different because most of the clients uh, that the company was selling to was either states or municipal um, authorities. Right. Well, really what my reading was to start a pretty big project, which was European Middle East um, liquidity management. So we basically did a European wide project to pull the liquidity and cash management and cash pools together and also implement a new treasury system at the same time. And so that was an all out treasury capability build. And that turned out to be quite a project easier because I knew my then boss and I had worked with her at the time when we were at Cadbury. So that was interesting because the customer base in the business was very, very different. It wasn't possibly the consumer good. It was now industrial healthcare up high technology and of course Europe Middle East was a huge amount of countries and of course the pick was at the time the European crisis was going on and so when you're selling stuff to Spanish Italian and Greek state or foreign municipalities 
it wasn't necessarily that easy to actually get paid for your stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it added another teach to it in the middle of all this the European crisis going on, added another uh, layer of complexity to it. The project went well. We went to the established the century century in Amsterdam. By the time the project was done, came to a decision that, you know, I don't necessarily want to sit in Amsterdam just having come back a couple of years back. Yeah. So then it was basically time to wrap up that project and then think about perhaps working for somebody else. So you joined, as you see, you're wetted, um, you, your Finnish accent a little bit better than mine, let's just say, <laughs> but obviously they're private group, so I don't want to intrude too much in it, but, you know, family owned, private, but what, what can you tell us about the group or talk us through some of their sort of treasury setup, if you like? Yes, indeed. And even though this is a private company, if you go on our website, you will find all the financial statements and everything else, just like any public company would actually publish them. So it's a very open company in that sense. This is a company which started off as way back. This is the, now the ninth generation that's running the company. The near history was shipping, trade ship, EP technology, and then um, line, my, line based mining. But before that, the company was actually in tobacco, alcohol, and sweet confectionery. So, you know, again, they've gone through many cycles of reinventing themselves. And so currently, the, the latest change is that it's an investment company holding various investments in the portfolio. The two biggest ones are eating technology, so radiated on the floor, eating various other which you would also find in the UK. Uh, for example, your mycin radiators would be Propretti. North Gulf is the, mine, uh, the mining business. So it's basically limestone, at which you then um, take and do very healthy with it. And it really goes into other industrial processes, production of steel, construction, concrete. It goes to environmental processes, glass, chemicals, you name it. And so Red Pig is the biggest European heating technology company, then then Nordkalk is the biggest Nordic one. And there are various others. Recently, we've also diversified to healthcare. So we now hold a a very sizable stake in a a Finnish private uh, healthcare provider, Deterverse Fellow, as well as some financial, uh, in the financial sector, we hold um, also a very sizable stake in a fund manager and corporate finance house called EQ. These are both listed companies, these two that I just mentioned. So there are privately owned, and then there are also stakes in listed companies. There are also various others. And so managing the, um, most of the treasury is geared to service the industrial companies, which obviously are about the 1 billion euro turnover in more than 20 countries, maybe European centric, but also in China, Russia, Turkey, a uh, little bit of US and, and of course, all the European countries, pretty yeah. much wherever you would need cheating. That's the next day. <laughs> I came in here and really there was a need to kind of update the processes, risk management policy and the protection and overall treasury management and competence. A very small team, we are three. But again, it's a very Nordic thing that, you know, we love technology. So uh, it's, it's very heavily relying on extremely efficient systems. And then, of course, you know, you have some pretty good talent because we can't really hire too many people to stay, you know, somehow sensible with the budgets. What we run here is a full in-house bank. It's a payments and receipts on behalf of those units providing all the foreign exchange, interest rate, commodity hedging services. Yeah. Of course, then all the intercompany loans, all the external funding goes through here and supporting the M&A activity, which is never ending in this company. Mm. Now you've made, you know, you've had a number of moves and number of roles within PLCs and public companies and things like that. And then you've made the moves private. How would, how have you found the contrast or the pros and cons, if you like, the advantages and disadvantages, what, what, you know, how would you describe that? Public companies are a good, it's a good school to understand how things are done usually quite well, because you've got rules and regulations on what you can and cannot do. Also, the companies I worked for were very, very big. And so, you know, those treasuries were top notch. That was a particular view. Private companies can be, obviously, they range from A to Z. Um, this, this particular one, when I joined, 
was probably a little bit stuck in its ways, but the Treasury Department had some pretty good starts with technology and pretty good starts within other processes. Size-wise, this is a big company in the Nordics, but this is not a particularly big company, which, if you put it to European or global context. Mm, mm. But here we are a pretty sizable, and I think things can move very, very fast, or they can move very, very slowly. <laughs> it depends really very much what the owners want and what kind of an agenda the owners want to implement. Thank you. And what happened here was, you know, again, we had the generational uh, change, our new CEO. And um, three years ago, he was, if I remember right, 36 years old at the time, he was part of the owning family. And then things all of started to change pretty far, a completely new gear. Mm-hmm. And, and then things started happening very fast. And then the pace has continued over the past three years, anything to do with funding, obviously investment. And so I suppose I enjoy the private side because, you know, again, you're very close, at least we are here, very close to the actual owners. We are in the same building, we see them every day, and they're very often in the same meeting. You get to see how they think, because, you know, if it's their own money, if it's not uh, shareholders' money in the stock market. Mm. So you, you tend to see that they can take very, very long horizon in some decisions. They, they, can, they can behave uh, sometimes in a different way compared to a listed company. In our case, it's a strength because we can get into investment cases. We don't have a set exit date. We don't have to behave like a PE fund. And so it gives us a, a different kind of an approach to investing uh, into, into new things and looking at our portfolio company. Mm. But then the downside, of course, is, you know, you can't afford to stay and, and, you know, expect that, you know, now that we're in here, you know, fine, let's just run these businesses. So the same rules apply. You have to reinvent yourself every couple of years in order to stay competitive. And in that sense, it doesn't really change. It's not any different to a PLC. And just, you talked there and touched on, you know, that they have this ethos around technology and things. Where do you see technology and where do you see the future? Treasury recently spoke to Ronan from Honeywell, and he was talking about AI automation and lots of different things like that. Is that something coming well to you guys or are you going a different direction or what was technology doing for you? When I refer to technology, it's really using the available treasury system in the in-house bank engine or use the fin provider, uh, electronic key voicing when it comes to that side of things. And so artificial intelligence and robotics and all that, not necessarily, that takes a bit of time. It can also take a, 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 a big investment in the sense that at least you need some people to uh, learn how to do that and it needs the others. What we focused on is really taking the products in the market and um, without customizing anything. I mean, customizations are kind of software houses don't really want to do that. I mean, we really have the budget to kind of, you know, take a system and then customize it for our needs. So what we've done is, you know, make the most of the system, but then develop the processes and fine tune the processes so we can get by with free people and service the whole group. And right. fully now thanks, just taking the systems and pushing those to the limits. We also take a, take an approach that, you know, things are very modular. It's not just one system that does everything. We pick maybe two, three systems, and then we use the bits from those which are best fit for a particular process. And then we make those systems talk to each other. And that, I think, is the recipe that's been successful for us. So, you know, picking three or four core systems uh, using the best bits from them and then just um, having them talk to each other. And then I suppose we've got some, I would call it robotics or AI, but really it's some automation which we've done with bits of middleware where we can consolidate and retrieve information and basically turn it into understandable information very fast. So supplementing the systems with some customized things, but they are not. I mean, it's mostly Excel based, but you can do a lot in that system if yeah. you use clever people to help you. Just looking back over your your career and your history, if you like, one of the things I, I noticed here was your ethos or attitude to study. You know, we'll come on to the, some of the people that are there with you and, you know, recruitment ideas. But when you're looking or when, when, when you look back over your career, rather, you've got treasury qualification. You've also then most recently studied you know, relatively recently for an MBA, what, why go to all the effort? What do you think that gives you? And then does that then 
influence you when you're looking for people and recruiting that you've got those things in your back pocket as it were? I enjoy studying. It's one of those things that it, it's always one of these things when you go back and uh, you have clever professors, you might be going through things that you'd studied before. But again, it's a refresher to start with. Second of all, you know, you do always learn something new. So the treasury, the AMTT, as it was called back then, was an absolutely key thing because it really gives you the theory and the hardcore of, you know, what this whole thing revolves around. So that's actually something I pretty much seen through as we see. Not very common in Finland. Not many people have done it or are doing it in Finland, but these two guys are doing it. And, and I think they will be very, um, very surprised by the time, you know, they're finished with it. It's a really good degree. MBA was another, um, it's a completely different thing, you know, where you would have maybe 20, 20 people there from completely different background, top professor from the best university. And so it gives you a um, theoretical step, but it also gives you the opportunity to, to go through problems. You know, if you've got 20 people in the room, you get 20 different approaches. It teaches you that, you know, there are many, many ways of solving the same problem and thinking about various angles. MBA is usually quite a bit of work and it was quite a bit of work. But I enjoyed it because it gave me contact and, you know, I know a lot more people. And I also understand how the business works in this country. This is, I think is actually the first thing company I worked for. So yeah, it was one of the, one of the twists, but NBA gives you a completely different angle. Is it worth it? I think it is. But if you do it, you have to go in the all in. It's no point sitting there for, you know, half of the lectures and then uh, it, you really kind of have to use the time and that match the time and invest in it. And then it gives you a lovely payback Yeah, by way of understanding things. And so when I look at people as a fit, we're a pretty small team. We have to have clever people, but it doesn't mean I have to have people who've been doing treasury for 30 years. No, it means I have to have people who can complement each other and also are hungry to learn things and also uh, take ownership. That's one of the big things which needs to happen in a small team is there needs to be rotation. There needs to be ownership. It doesn't really work. A small team can't punk. And how do you assess that? If you're, you know, maybe if you're looking for new people and things, how, how can you, how can they prove that they're sitting there in front of you, you're interviewing them, but you know, oh, I took ownership of this. I, well, yeah, prove it to me. Or how, how do you sort of get them to either justify as it were? That, that is a digital one all the time. I think there's a silver bullet. And yeah, first of all, you need to have enough candidates, you know, and sourcing is of course, one of the things which, where traditionally, you know, you kind of ask for some help from the recruitment agencies. Of course, you know, you get the pretty good pre-screening at that point. We used also some recruitment companies for, for testing these guys, you know, general test uh, interviews. And that sort of gives you a short list references. I did a lot of calling around their previous managers, previous companies, okay. uh, other colleagues who may have worked with them. And so you kind of have to um, find the pieces of the puzzle. Ultimately, I still believe in the old fashioned interview process, not 15 rounds, but you know, two, maximum three. Mm. But if you take enough time and you set the environment such that you can have a good discussion not necessarily just going through the CV and, and sort of a, a formal engineering approach, but, you know, having a discussion, talking about examples, completely random things, you begin to get a pretty good sense of these people and what they're like. Are they sociable? Have they had drive? Do they have drives? Why do they want to work for you? This particular company, perhaps I'm old fashioned, but, you know, I still think the actual interviewing process has a big part in it. Mm. And generally speaking, we get very good, you know, treasury is not a, a big area in Finland. Obviously, we only have so many companies that need a treasury department per se, but but you get very good candidates, um, many engineering backgrounds, um, also more traditional economics, corporate finance people. And then there is a big split. Um, either you work for a bank or you work for a corporate. Mm. And I suppose it works that way also in London. And so uh, through these, putting these pieces together, you get a pretty good idea on what you're looking for. And then of course you need a bit of luck. 
top talent uh, is, is, I suppose, relatively easy to find by way of formal education, but then finding that person who's able to take ownership, take things and execute things, and, uh, and also, you know, actually then finally being sociable. Yeah, you need a bit of luck, but so far I have an extremely good team and, and we were very, very lucky to get these hungry young guys who um, are all of these things that I mentioned. But I think also you take, as you describe it there, you you know, built up a picture of them, not just a snapshot at an interview. As you said, you looked at lots of different sources of reference, as it were. So evidence from past employers, past bosses, or people that you know, you, you know in common maybe that then that's how you build up a, a better picture of them rather than just, all oh, right, great interview today, thanks. Yeah, offer them the job. It's much wider than that from the sounds of it. And it needs to be because, you know, treasury is not, it's not a huge market here in Finland. It's a very specialist area. People usually want to work in treasury unless they're very, very junior. They do tend to know the basics and that helps. And then what you then have to do is speak from the pieces of specific expertises. So one in the current team, you know, there's, there is more of an accounting strength there. And the other one is more market uh, hedging and, and risk management geared and then we both have to learn these things and rotate and then perhaps I bring other things to the table which I can then teach them. And so it's also trying to find then some specific expertise and strengths which you can put together. Mm. And But as the team is pretty small, you know, they have to accept it from the beginning that, you know, they will have to do things which they may not necessarily like or it's not necessarily something which is which, which is their strength but they'll get exposure to those things. And that's the magic thing is getting exposure. I find when you give these guys sufficient challenges, they seem to work harder and really because they understand they're going to learn the process themselves. Okay. And as we wrap up today's show, I spoke to Toby before and we, we got permission again to, we'll put his LinkedIn profile on the show notes so you can get there. That's yes. with all our shows. Someone goes on that, they look at your background, they look at the, successful career you've had from Yagio, Cadbury's, Tesco's, Carestream, and now I think you obviously got great corporate treasury background. Someone looks at that, actually, that's what I want. Looking back over it and in summary of you, what would you say, what advice would you offer those looking at it? Well, the first is a study bit. You go through the sufficient training, for example, the uh, corporate treasurer's training. That's always good. But then it's also looking at the various opportunities. Sometimes be a bit adventurous. Somebody offers you things. Maybe you have to relocate. That's not, I mean, it's always a bit of a hassle, but it tends to be easier when you're young. And so you should try and do that, you know, before the whole family thing dips into the picture. And another thing is if you are moving jobs, then the next one should be something which is new. Don't don't move from one job to another where, where, you know, you do the same thing. Always try and find another focus and build a rounded experience in treasury because then if you're able to work in all of those different areas of treasury, then that after a while gives you a much more rounded experience, which you can yeah. apply instead of becoming a deep specialist in some area, you're able to approach things in a more holistic way. Yeah. And I suppose that's what I tried consciously doing because it went pretty well, but I did enjoy the ride around the world and I would thoroughly recommend it to anybody. If there is a chance, then take up those various opportunities, even though it might look a bit scary or it might not be the thing that you're, you've done before, but then the whole point is to learn new things. And yeah, it's hard work, but you know, it's very satisfying when you then get the opportunity to do something you haven't done before. So don't be afraid to take the risk and, and, and go and do it. Absolutely. Yes. Situations change and, you know, economic cycles change. But I tend to believe that if you do your job well, you'll be well placed. And if you get this rounded experience, you know, you will do even better. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed that amazing episode with Toppy. And uh, that was back in April 2019. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing we're doing these revisit to some of these past guests where Treasury's taken them. And Toppy will explain to you, it's gone a few places since then. So April 2019, we'll talk about fast-tracking your Treasury career, which is a great segue, if you like, into what happened next. Toppy's on the line with me now. 
He's continued. He's still with Rettig. But Toppy, would you pick up the story maybe from there to now and, and we can explore a little bit more because the company's changed, but also your roles evolved. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Mike. Good talking to you again. Yeah. A lot happened over the past few years. Yes, so indeed, a lot of changes happened in the group, primarily also in 2020, 2021, having a look at the strategy. It's a family-owned company. So the ninth generation who is now in charge wanted to revisit some of the strategy. And, and when we talk about a family company, we're not talking two or three years, we're talking at least the next generation. What should we do as a company? And so changes happened and and I became the CFO of the company after a few different turns and twists. Yeah. Last year was a big year. We exited our industrial holdings. We sold the mining, mining business. Uh, we sold our marine insurance business. And then finally we listed our HVAC business, Burma, which was, uh, which was in fact listed in a DSPAC deal. So that was an interesting, a very different kind of approach. It was an IPO basically. But as it was a, a SPAC deal, it had a lot more new things that nobody had ever done before. So that was a, a great year of learnings, but it was a great, it was a busy year. Yeah. And a lot of things that I didn't necessarily think that CFO would have to, would have to deal with mainly, of course, the traditional things, recording internal, external, of course, taxation, but then managing outsourced, for example, accounting uh, and IT providers. I'm not exactly an, an IT person yet. Uh, you have to learn what those guys provide and what, and what the things are that they, that they deal with so you can guide them and you can keep it all together. A little bit of HR stuff. Uh, we also own the property where the offices are. So dealing with tenants, property related things. So it's a very wide job description, shall we say. Of course, I still take care of funding risk management, but in a slightly different way. So from the beginning of this year, we are a pure investment company, a relatively large for a Nordic as, a, as you know, for the Nordic landscape. And so therefore things like taxation, funding, for example, have changed a lot in their form, in their approach. And how would you say, do you reflect back, you know, we've known each other your entire treasury career and now it's treasury and CFO ship. How would you say that treasury has maybe prepared you for that? Or, you know, if you reflect back on what treasury gave you and also maybe what it didn't, didn't give you, what were the, what were the gaps or what are the, as you said, you know, you and I have talked, we talked before the show just briefly that. It has been huge challenges, a wider remit and everything else, and also all this change with the group. Explain to me, if you would, how it is different or, you know, what, what did, you know, what's it done? We've got all these other podcasts where we catch up with people who have made that transition, springboarded from treasury into a CFO role where loads of people used to want to do it. They're going, oh no, you're too special. And actually I'm now starting to see it. So treasury is becoming an effective stepping stone. What's it been like for you, if you like, if maybe if you just give a reflection on that? Well, let's start with the strong points, the, the ones, the certain applic applicable skills and mindsets that are very good that you can carry over from treasury. I think one is of course, funding and risk management. You still need it as a CFO. Ultimately, even though you might not be directly operating those things yourself, you're still at least morally responsible for your team to to, to carry those tasks properly. What's been very good is that because I dealt with funding and risk management and now the whole funding scene changed from basically borrowing money based on cash flows and no collateral. Now as an investment company, it changes completely different. It is now based on collaterals. There is no stable cash flow EBITDA anymore as you would have as an, in, in, in an industrial company. That's good. You understand currencies, you understand interest rates, you understand economics, at least on, on moderate level, if you're not an economist, but all those things become important in my role. So those are the things which I have been able to apply directly. What I had not done in the treasury role is overall external reporting. That was a learning curve, of course, your group consolidated financials, the whole audit process. Of course, in treasury, you were part of the audit process, 
and part of the financials, but it wasn't the whole set all the way from the beginning to the end. Right. So that's one thing where it would have been great to have more exposure to those things. But sometimes in treasury, that's not possible. It depends on the company. And the other one is taxation. Taxation is something you understand in treasury in relation to treasury instruments and how realized and unrealized things come through in your PL and what you need to do with them. But when you are a CFO, you have to take responsibility for all of the taxation. That's the income taxation, capital gains, losses, value added tax, VATs, and interest deductions, all sorts of other things, and, and the whole of the transfer pricing, which you still need in, in many, at least in a group where you've got many subsidiaries. So that was a thing where I probably lacked most knowledge. And how do we solve it was, well, we have the big four companies, your typical consultants who can then help you and you can draw on that support. Mm -hmm. And the agreement was then that we will simply use those relationships, deepen them, and then ask for substantial help. So we get all those tricky things solved up front, and we don't have to get surprises along the way. And maybe, maybe a little bit more legal work as well, not just treasury related funding or, or typical treasury contracts, but everything <laughs> flows through my desk. So a little bit of the same thing applies with attorneys, you know, different offices. And so we've got good relationships with a, with a few and we liaise with those guys heavily in order to make sure that all the legals are in good shape. Topper, you touch on there that you didn't have input to the account start to finish because it's, it wasn't your role before, but it, you know, you've identified that as a, not necessarily a skills gap by any means, but sort of an exposure gap, if you like, and where you know, so if, if there are people listening and we, you know, we try and educate these, you know, junior guys, more senior guys about what they should be thinking that they're listening now, they go, wow. And it's, it's always great content with you because you, you've got such clarity of thought and, and then you're lucky to be listening to this, everyone listening there. It's this podcast is free. We should be charging for this amazing content. Don't worry. We're not going to charge, but joking aside, it, like, you know, you look, looking back, you know, and, and as again, someone listening, they might go, oh yeah, well I should. What advice are you giving? These aren't the takeaways. We'll come to those in a minute, but what are the pieces of advice as you know, again, maybe in reflective mood, you sit back in your armchair, not with a whiskey yet, maybe later. Vodka. You gave me some amazing finished vodka before. <laughs> still, still remember drinking that. That was very nice. But in general, what, what would you say to those guys listening that, you know, they should think about doing or should they do other placements or they should, do, you know, you know, try and get involved in this, 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 or what, what would you sort of recommend to people? the right way. Yes. It very much depends on the organization. If it is a large organization, then there are many opportunities. And I think the first thing is put your hand up and say, I'm interested. I'd like to volunteer participating in projects, be it M&A, be it funding, policy, a little bit on the financial statements, maybe notes to the accounts. Try to get involved. Ask if you can be involved because that's how you get the exposure. Treasury is slightly technical and, mm. and I often say that and the, it goes both ways. When you step out of the treasury department area, that's usually where understanding of treasury dissipates after that. And so if you understand those technical things, try to get exposure to other things which are around you. Maybe some of the tax things, if there are projects going on, but, but some of the obvious things where th that come treasury's way often would be M&A projects, transactions big reorganizations, get into those teams if you can, because they give you great insight into how the company works. And that's where you begin to get understanding of what other things happen around you in the company. And you get that exposure, which is not necessarily hundred percent directly in your job description yeah. or your responsibility, but in a good organization, if your boss or, or some other departments understand and they want to collaborate, then grab the opportunity. Absolutely. Because it's also, as you say, it's going to, you're preparing yourself, you're building, you know, we talked about treasury in the past being a foundation sort of uh, many areas, but sometimes it lacks specificity, you know, and, and, and actually having that skill set exactly as you described there that, you know, get out of your comfort zone, but also having someone like yourself that's in that role of CFO and having been in treasury, you, you know, been there, won it, and you 
definitely got the t-shirt. So, you know, it's something that people can definitely learn from. I mean, you've been very kind. We, we jumped on this last minute, really, to have a, a great catch up with Toppy. So it's kind for this time. But again, you gave some great takeaways in the previous episode. But on top of that, we're three years later. You know, we've been through pandemic. You know, you may be reflecting on that and everything else. What other things would you maybe reshare with the audience that they, you think they should be doing? You know, we touched on a little bit of that, but that and or, you know, your reflection go, yeah, I wish I'd done this. I wish I said this. What are your thoughts? Over the past three years, the, the whole pandemic was, it changed a lot of things. And I'm not really sure how to guide people specifically, but what I did take away from that period, first, the pandemic, nobody really knows what's happening. And then a bit of a financial crunch happening because nobody knows what's happening. And then realigning a lot of strategies and policies after that, uh, of course, is kind of natural. What I would say from my transition from treasury to CFO is be prepared to, if you do that step, you're going to have to be involved in many, many things which aren't really directly in your job description. It's a general management director role that involves a lot of things that just happen to come along and you're pulled into many things. So, so keep an open mind, be very flexible. That's one. And I would say plan widely. I suppose one of the things that I took away from the whole pandemic thing is let go of some of the old ways. You don't have to sit at the office every day. You can think slightly out of the box and not just with regards to where you sit and where you actually have your laptop any given day, but how you do other things. And I I think some of the good things that came out of the past two, three years was that people are a lot more flexible on ideas, development, and how to approach things. So I guess keep that flexibility. Don't let go of that and, and focus on, still focus on the basics. The basics don't go away. Decent risk management, prudent funding, think ahead. So, so that's fine, but leverage on the opportunity that the past two, three years have provided. Of course, now we've got, especially here in Europe and especially this side of Europe and Finland, the Ukraine crisis, Finland potentially joining NATO, all that stuff is changing the mindsets here in a different way. And it does weird things to risk appetite and it does weird things to your approach, how you deal with the next five years and, and how you make your business model robust. All these shocks that come across tried to find the good outcome in the sense that, well, use it and leverage it to improve the processes and improve your thinking about, well, how do I deal with this in a flexible way and in a, in a sensible way, not just for the next two, two weeks or the next quarter. You know what, if you're listening today, you should be thinking number one, to definitely get Toppy in your network. He's an amazing guy to have there, but some of the stuff there, I was just, just listening and listening and, you know, the one that keeps you know, let go of the old ways. Oh my goodness. I mean, that, that, that'll be the subtitle, I think, for the update episode, you know, because it's so powerful, mate. That's, I'm just grateful that you were able to share such amazing nuggets. We should send a bill out to everyone listening today. We won't, but next time we see they can be buying the drinks because you're giving amazing value and I'm just very grateful. Uh, literally, I can't wait to see you and it will be fantastic, but that's when you've uh, carried on sorting your house out and everything else, all the other things you have to do alongside a mentally busy job as a CFO. So uh, thank you for your time. We'll put Toppy's details in the show notes. And uh, yeah, you'd be lucky to have him in your networks, everyone out there. So thank you very much. So you're a star. Thanks, Mike. Have a good weekend, mate. I do. Hello, it's Mike here again. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. If you did, then maybe you want to follow the show or subscribe, depending on where you listen whether that's iTunes, Spotify, or another great place to listen to the show from. It's totally free, and means that you'll be the first to see each and every week when we release a new show. And maybe whilst you're there, you could even leave a quick review. Reviews and ratings are among the most important metrics for a podcast to effectively rank. And as you can probably appreciate, the podcast is a lot of hard work to produce every week. It'd be amazing. Just take, say, 20 seconds, leave a quick review of my amazing guests and their great career stories. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks very much, and I can't wait to see you soon.